Uh, the issue of mini Schengen is an issue which is of specific attention uh, to my Bulgarian and Romanian blog, and I'll ask you about that. But I uh, wanted first of all to ask something else. Um, you mentioned that maybe Bulgarians have some tendency to capsulate, <laughs> to, in, to close themselves with regards to the Westerners. And I was wondering whether Westerners also don't have uh, some issue when approaching people from the peripheral zones of the world. Uh, because um, my experience at least is that too, too often the question is who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, who we have to support. And I have the feeling that uh, uh, often the uh, interest to, towards the peripheral zone, such as Bulgaria, Romania is limited basically to uh, supporting the lesser evil or whatever you call it, but it's not in, really in, there is no such genuine deep interest uh, which maybe you have in yourself in your life to understand the complexity, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is also kind of um, evading. Maybe my, my feeling is that Bulgarians are not very interesting or doesn't appear to be very complex at first sight. Uh, but uh, that is uh, the art of, in a way, of international relations that you maybe even discover something which people themselves don't know about themselves, and that mm -hmm. makes you play a positive role. So I'm, I'm basically that is uh, something I want to understand better. Uh, what is this? Um, uh, why is the Western public or Western media or Western politi politi political decision makers not really deep in interested? Uh, don't want to understand us, rather they want to play one part of our society against the other part. Or maybe that's my impression, maybe I'm wrong about that. But I have this feeling, there is always good and bad guys. Mm -hmm. And you see that in our politics, they change, internally they change. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't know what the West makes of uh, Eastern Europe. I, I mean, I, I know, I mean, I can assure you that there will be people from, from my class, my social class, people with my level of education in Britain, who are still not terribly sure precisely where Bulgaria is geographically in the world. So there is that aspect of it. It's sometimes it's just down to pure ignorance. But I, th I think those who are playing political and, and um, corporate games in South East, the Southeast Balkans, Eastern Balkans, Southeast, Southeastern Europe. Um, they, 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 they take a, a sort of contradictory, self-contradictory um, position with regards to this area. One minute, South, this, southern and eastern Balkans have got to represent some sort of buffer zone against the east, most especially uh, in the context of uh, the, the migration into Europe from, from North Africa and from the Middle East, the Far East. So there's got to be a buffer against this uh, torrent of migrants that we, 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 we were told we, sh we should expect. But at the same time, they've got to reconcile themselves to the idea that the East already has a significant influence within this area of the Balkans. Bulgaria's got quite a sizable Turkish population, which has got political representation which it sometimes uses is quite effectively, thank you very much. Um, a lot of Bulgaria's cultural mores and behaviours are Eastern in character. And also, how is it legitimate to have this sort of anti-Eastern uh, viewpoint with regard to the Balkans, but not consider the situation, for instance, in the Mediterranean? You know, when I've, I've stood in Gibraltar and looked across to North Africa, in fact, I've done it in the opposite direction as well. I've been to Italy. I've been to Spain. I've seen the Islamic 
legacies in these countries. So it's as if it's as if the great powers in the West really can't make up their mind about the Syria in the Balkans. And like I say, they, they seem to contradict themselves sometimes. What, there was something that's been circulating in Facebook around among my friends recently. It was um, Joseph Stilgitz, the, the, is that his name? The, the economist, Nobel Prize winner, winning economist, was making certain comments about how uh, Bulgaria and, and, and other countries in this part of the Balkans are actually a lot worse off because of EU accession, which is, has allowed Western corporations to, as it were, plunder the country, use the country as a plaything, um, but to come in, set up corporations or take over Bulgarian companies, take over uh, vast swathes of Bulgarian industry and act extractively, taking the profits out of the country and not adding much in terms of value in Bulgaria. Uh, they've impacted heavily on pricing structures in Bulgaria, the, the, the cost of utilities, the cost of basic foodstuffs. They're, they're expecting Bulgarian corporations to spend it vast amounts of money on advertising and marketing, uh, which is not something that Bulgarians have traditionally been terribly good at. Um, so it, it's as if the West is using the area exploitatively at the moment. But like I say, I, I, I can't figure out what the strategy is or, or how they actually see Bulgaria. Maybe, as it still gets suggests, they see opportunities, uh, but uh, we use an expression in the West, we want what you've got to offer, but we don't want you. You know, it, it's usually applied to um, migrants from, from Europe into the UK, for instance, post-Brexit, or Easterners coming into European countries They've got skills, they, they, they can take up jobs, especially in, in the, the lower paid employment sector. So we need you, but we don't particularly want you. And I've got a funny feeling this, this is quite a good way to express the Western attitude towards the Balkans. I think if we're introducing the West-East contradiction which is now really exacerbated with this war in Ukraine. Okay. And uh, um, I also am happy that uh, uh, West is conscious or, as you said, uh, there is understanding that things are not uh, so... It's not so simply to say which is the good and the bad side. There is some truth maybe in uh, various positions which can be taken or various criticisms which can be made. And... Uh, I just uh, wondered whether West and East uh, are maybe not something which is maybe remains from the Cold War a little bit, um, and rather isn't today the division more between center and periphery. Uh, because I see that um, uh, this contradiction, center, periphery, it can be found in any society here, but basically maybe in any society in the world even. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that uh, the center uh, naturally tends to be more aligned to the capitalist center, in at least in our region, aligned to the Western European or American center of capitalism. And uh, um, my intuition is that the people who are not attached to this center, they are not so evil or stupid or whatever, but uh, just given that the Bulgarian social game is constructed around mutual domination, if one side moves to in one direction, the other side, which is the periphery, somehow seems to be more open to other peripheries, let's say, uh, potentially at least, and maybe it's opened with limits in the sense that they are united by some resistance to the center, but... Uh, uh, maybe if they have to cooperate with one another, they will not be so <laughs> attracted. Again, that's something which I 
derived from my experience and may be wrong. So we have a polarization and polarization has been a strong issue in the West too. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, when we are in Bulgaria, we know that polarization now is very strong in Bulgaria society, especially the war in Ukraine strengthens that additionally. And I was curious, what is the path forward when there is such strong polarization and you are strongly uh, encouraged or pressed to take one or the other side. And I have the feeling Bulgarians unconsciously, maybe or uh, un- uh, intuitively, somehow want to be a little bit like bridge, not so much choosing one or the other side. Uh, I think our governments especially in the peaceful times before the war in Ukraine, uh, always had this element that they're bridging the West and the East, or if you wish, the center and the periphery. And I'm I'm curious, how can we live in now in peace when West and East, or whatever you call them, are in war? Um, bridging. Um... I think, you know, we use an expression in the West, if you try to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. Uh, I think it can apply to this stance in Bulgaria of um, the need to pander to or the need to show uh, solidarity with the European Union but also at the same time with the United States. And there, there are many differences between the European the Union and the United States. A, a lot of commentators say that the United States don't have a lot of time, uh, a lot of affinity, a lot of admiration for the European Union. And, and obviously in, in, uh, in the neoliberal context, there, there is competition between the two power bases. Uh, Russia's still cast a shadow over this part of the country. Um, so I, I, I can I can empathise with this attempt to to be neutral, but it's a very uncomfortable position to be in, because every time you you're forced through uh, geopolitical events to to turn and face one of the great powers, you've got to perform in one way, and then maybe in a few weeks' time, you've got to turn towards the other and perform in a completely different way. It's, it's a very, very uh, stressful and, and difficult position to try to occupy. And this is why I uh, emotionally... Uh, as someone with empathy towards the Bulgarians, I, I wish there was a way that you could convincingly state uh, your own personal identities, your, your, your own national identities. You, you, you could take steps towards self-determination in relation to these powers that are dragging you this way and then dragging you that way. So I, 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 and uh, I think first what has to happen is that your political parties should not be exploiting uh, these different affinities. One's pro-Russian, one's pro-American, one's pro-European Union. I, I, I think politically Bulgaria needs to think about Bulgarians primarily. Uh, and how best the, the 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 well-being and the economic welfare and the cultural identity of your country can be uh, established and sustained instead of having to perform to all these puppeteers <laughs> that are holding the strings. Uh, it's a terrible position to be in. But, but I think uh, I, uh, my feeling is that how, that is how Bulgaria feels. Okay, 
I certainly agree that it's very difficult when uh, the Poles are in war to be some kind of a middle ground or connection point. But uh, I just need to mark that sometimes that happens. And we see that in the case of Turkey. And there have been traditionally some countries which are uh, some kind of a bridge countries like Austria or Israel, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but of course, um, uh, I can certainly understand that Bulgaria still has work to do if it ever manages to reach the international recognition or importance of such countries which manage to be not only, um, how can I say, passively uh, bridge, but also some kind of countries which have subjectivity and like Turkey engaging different parties and bringing some connection between them. But I took also another point from your words. Um, I think you mentioned in, in other words that West and Russia are being weaponized in our society. And uh, uh, when there is weaponization by somebody, um, there is this danger that if he is not uh, ethically or in other way he is not well established or is not worthy of being supported, then maybe also the thing which is weaponized loses its power or strength. And I was curious about that. We see that today, on one hand, we have weaponization of democracy, human rights, these good liberal values. Uh, we have uh, from the part of administration of Joe Biden, for example. And on the other hand, we have weaponization uh, even during Trump era of traditional family traditions. Uh, so, uh, uh, and of course, when there is weaponization, uh, people somehow speak to themselves. They think their value, which they weaponize, is self-sufficient, and they just stay, say need to state it, and then say who is the enemy and who is not aligned. But I wonder, isn't there some trap? when you weaponize even the most noble values, isn't that a, a way to their, um, to the loss of their significance, in fact, or power? Hmm. Um, I mean, first of all, your point about being, having the status of a bridge or uh, a country that's able to state its neutrality, well, to be a bridge, you need some sort of solidity, some sort of structure. And uh, and to be a bridge, you need the the warring countries or the, the, the countries that are creating this polarization in global affairs to depend on you. And I don't think Bulgaria has got that strength. Bulgaria is too de dependent on on the warring countries. Um, but to get to your second point. Um, about the weaponization of things like civil rights and uh, family values. Um, a lot of it, we're getting back to, to some extent, back to tribalism again. A lot of it comes from naivety, for instance. Um, uh, and the fact that the people who tend to talk about these sorts of issues tend to be middle class and have a, uh, a certain level of privilege and a, a certain level of uh, confidence in their own status and pride in their own status in, in the different nations in which they live in the West. I mean, something that was very interesting to me I mean, many, many years ago, and I think it must have been something like 15 years ago in Bulgaria, we were trying to introduce the concept of foster care to Bulgaria. You know, the, the, the situation whereby children who, for one reason or another, can't safely remain in their own families, could be raised in another family uh, without the child actually being adopted to become the certificated son or daughter of, of the new family. Now, we were trying to introduce this concept into Bulgaria, but the consultants from the West almost inevitably came with materials and video clips that showed 
a very Western style of family. Uh, the families almost looked out, looked like the, the ideal family from a Danone advert, you know, a yoga, uh, a, a, <laughs> a yoga advert. They had beautiful blonde hair and they lived in these wonderful houses and uh, they looked nothing like a Bulgarian family. Uh, when my organisation closed the first baby home uh, in, in Bulgaria, way back in 2010, 2011, we, we had to actually warn people, our Western partners, that some of the models they used for, for uh, parenting and, and family dynamics didn't work in Bulgaria. Again, they were based on Western middle class standards and behaviours. They certainly wouldn't work in, for instance, the, the Roma community here in Bulgaria, where the culture is entirely different. Uh, so there, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that we just can't import values from one place to the other. Uh, there has to be a, a level of acceptance of the the depth of the, the culture um, among other social groups or in other nations. And there has been this unfortunate tendency uh, from the West using human rights as the weapon to attempt to colonise other countries and import its own values into these countries. I don't think it's done in a malign way. It, it's, it's, it's just naivety, it's blinkeredness. It's not realising that the values that you hold dear don't necessarily apply in the, those other countries. So uh, if you're attempting to globalise, if you're attempting to spread liberal ideas, you've also got to be prepared to localise and, and respect local cultural tradition. Uh, and, I, and I think it's been this blindness that has allowed political movements to, to weaponise these different values and set them against each other. For instance, the human rights activists in Bulgaria are at war with the populists who make reference to traditional Orthodox Christian values in Bulgaria. There isn't necessarily a conflict. It's just the extreme versions of both these things are being weaponized for political purposes. Okay, um, you mentioned that um, pure uh, imitation or uh, globalization of certain uh, concepts or approaches doesn't work in the periphery automatically. But still, I when I look at the politics in our region, Central and Southeastern Europe, uh, there is over and over this contradiction between techno-populists, you know, that is anti-corruption tendency in society, middle class pro-corporations, pro-Biden, and uh, the um, conservative populists, let's say, urbanists, uh, who, as we said, uh, are more related to uh, traditional values or to oligarchy, to some kind of national capital. Uh, of course, now we, see, we have an interesting situation in Bulgaria where uh, the presumably the two parties which are faces of this uh, these two con these contradicting tendencies seem to be aligning for a government, uh, but still uh, we have over and over this contradiction and we don't seem to have a populism of our own, which maybe sounds stupid, I don't know, but I, I'm curious to ask you um, why our societies have these similar contradictions in politics and why they don't develop let's say, a populism of their own or some kind of political tendency of their own. <laughs> Have you thought about that? Um, 
I, I know what you're referring to. Um, and it's, it's something I encounter. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a political animal, although I do, I do have to um, deal with Bulgaria's politicians. Uh, I mean, I work in the NGO sector, so I, I work in the human rights sector. I, uh, and something I see is that, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. Something I see, there's a, a lot of my Bulgarian colleagues in the sector uh, are maybe more zealous and have less self-doubt about some of the human rights issues and, and the way they need to be projected in Bulgaria than, for instance, I have. Uh, there was an essay I, I read years and years ago, I can't remember the name of Samson, I think he was. I think he, he was a social anthropologist from the University of Lund in Sweden, who'd worked in this region, primarily in Albania, but I, I think he'd, he'd done some work in uh, Romania as well. And he referred to these uh, Romanians, Bulgarians, these local people who worked for the big international uh, agencies like UNICEF, like Eurochild, like the World Bank, uh, on the issues of human rights, uh, they, they, they tend to develop into a style of comprador bourgeoisie. You know, they, they become more Western in, in the way they present themselves uh, than the Westerners themselves. Uh, and they become very comfortable in uh, the style of living that it provides for them and the prosperity and the, the status and the, the you know there's an expression there's nothing uh, worse than a zealot or a convert someone who's taken on the values of uh, another group and often and i often say I, I meet bulgarians who are more western than i am uh, and uh, so I see that they are very supportive of this technocratic, um, very Western, very human rights oriented political movement. But I do have a degree of empathy for the other side. Uh, so I... Uh, I, I don't know where this leads, Vladimir. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I I, I know exactly what you're referring to this this polarization, and and, and how it's based on uh, extreme versions of, of certain basic human ideas, and that and we really need to find the middle ground. And, and, and realize that the differences between the two poles are not that extreme. Uh, maybe if they talk to each other in a little bit more civil fashion and mixed, <laughs> they, they would understand something they would, and, and learn to accept some of the truths that are coming from the other side. Uh, so it's, a, it's about, it's about, it's about positive relations again. We're back to social capital. Giving the other side the space and the time and the opportunity to express themselves civilly and you doing the same and learning from each other rather than this constant opposition and, and staying apart and just hurling insults at one another. Uh, something has to give in terms of compromise and, and, and seeing the seeing the realism and the truth in each other's positions. Here you touch another notion which I am curious to launch before you. Um, Western political theory or sociological thinking has created the notion of unlearn or unlearning. So basically I think it's also a Heideggerian idea that um, uh, 
through life uh, we accumulate certain power over being and uh, uh, we see how especially now in Bulgaria I think it's seen how people who have maybe for decades accumulating been accumulating certain um, certain kind of hegemony within their own bounds uh, in one or the other direction in which society now is being polarized and they just unleash this uh, strength or might which they have accumulated and it is returned the hatred is returned towards them from the other side and uh, I have the feeling this mutual battle leads to more and more accumulation in a way of power over being they more and more alienate from some maybe some condition which maybe has existed in their early life when they have not been so politicized or have been just normal citizens without mm. this might which they have accumulated over time. So I'm I'm here here this is let's say a kind of challenging at least for me. Um when there is war, how can especially maybe not in the case of Bulgaria not with uh hot war but still um the voice when you say to people like not to not to fight but to unlearn what they have been thinking makes them more themselves. Now, how, how can that really be communicated or is it really a valid uh, approach? Because I have the feeling without the unlearn, we always accumulate more and more. And it just can't end. With the, it ends only with death. Mm-hmm. Some, there's something I do in my own personal study. Uh, something I do uh, when I'm adopting positions. Uh, or wanting to put across an argument. Uh, it's a very good exercise to actually read what the people are saying, those people who are, uh, are likely to be opponents of your argument. It's, it's a very good exercise to, to see what the opposition is saying because, one, it enables you to test your arguments against their arguments and just see how convincing or how, how adept you are at deconstructing their arguments. But alternatively, it's almost inevitable that I'll, I'll find that there's truth in the opposing argument. They're not wrong, but neither am I. It is possible for opponents to both be right. And I think this is, in essence, the basis of compromise. Uh so it, it, it's as if we need to, how shall I put it, create a safe space where it's possible for potential opponents or people who are throwing stones at one another to safely tell their stories, their versions of reality to each other and come to realise that neither one of them is necessarily wrong. Um mm-hmm. Maybe what we need is is some sort of facilitator in the middle, uh, some sort of neutral body in the middle that sort of says, right, come together, sort of bangs heads together, right, come together, both of you, uh, and I'm going to, I'm not going to let you war with one another, just talk to one another in civil fashion. Um, I I don't think this is, has ever happened politically in Bulgaria. Uh, there's a tendency to, to for, for the minority parties or the new reform parties to have to, for the sake of their own existence, for sustaining their their, their own influence, have to side with one of the bigger parties, one of the coalitions or the other coalition. There's never been a a strong enough neutral body in Bulgaria to, to bring the opponents together or to stand between them and say, look, we've got to, to, to reach a situation of compromise for the good of everybody. Yes, uh, I wonder whether um, contradictions may not be easily, more easily understood, maybe not resolved, but understood if we uh, see them as uh, if we see their economical base, 
Uh, so, for example, um, the technocratic element generally has the support of the financial sector or IT industry, and the oligarchical uh, tendency usually has uh, the construction sector or maybe the military, I don't know, because if we look at the American politics, at least we see that uh, Joe Biden has been known for his ties to the to some strong financial institutions during, including during his time in a senator from Delaware. And we see that Trump uh, uh, did a lot to in the construction sector and later uh, signed a lot of contracts for military deliveries <laughs> to countries in the world. Uh, so uh, I just wonder whether if we look at the politics as purely economical game, whether it will not be more honest and whether we will be not more aware where our interest lies. Because I guess the big number of people are not um, businessmen or don't own their own business. And maybe they will ask themselves then, Uh, how can we be represented in this politics when we don't have the economical resources? And maybe if they ask this question, maybe there will be some new answer. Mm. I'm not comfortable and I don't know uh, whether this criterion of uh, a politician's alignment to a particular economic, particular part of the commercial sector, a particular part of the economy always prevails. Um, whether it depends on the, 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 their own personal background, where, where they've, they've been employed or uh, the business interests that they've, they've had in the past. Um, it's almost like saying that uh, the idealism uh, has gone out of politics and it's all an economic game nowadays. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that's true. Okay, but still, uh, we I, I think it's common wisdom in a way that um, big business somehow gets more represented in parliaments or in governmental institutions than uh, people who are not, uh, who are just workers, let's say, or just don't have their own business. Uh, so I, I'm, I was curious to ask you, uh, how can this problem of representation be somehow changed? Uh, my own uh, thinking about that is that either people should receive some way, should have some way to obtain resources without having capital in the first, in the beginning, or maybe politics should be somehow changed so that it is not only a competition of those who have resources. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, man, this, this is, a, okay, the, now you, you reframed what you were saying. This, this is an issue that's, that academics and political theorists have been struggling with in the West. Uh, how do you reduce the influence of big business in politics and give ordinary citizens a, a greater degree of um, representation? And a greater degree of influence over decision making. Um, there have been different models put forward about how how to um, allocate points, as it were, or allocate um, lobbying power to different individuals or different groups um, so that um, groups in civil society or um, groups created from the general public can actually be awarded e equal 
uh, status with business groups. Um, the, the ideas are, are <laughs> sound appealing, but I don't know how practical they are. Uh, because in essence, what we're talking about is is a is a style of corruption. Uh, the 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 way that money always seems to talk, the way that money buys influence. So what we're really talking about is not how to allocate um, lobbying power to different sectors in society. What we're really talking about is how to take the corruption out of politics and how to prevent powerful individuals, powerful in the sense of extremely wealthy or, how, or powerful industries who, who are capable of spending mind-bogglingly big, big sums on political lobbying, how to prevent this from actually happening. Um, I really don't have the answer, Vladimir, if, if, I'm, if I'm to be honest. Okay, it's good that still the question is asked. No, and, well, uh, I mean, it's a very legitimate question, and I know there are a lot of very, minds a lot better than mine working on this question as to how to to create create a level platform, a, a level playing field, so that the the, the 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 masses, the general population, have as much lobbying strength, as much competence. To influence politics as big big business has, uh, and I don't think anybody's come up with a satisfactory <laughs> solution as yet. Simply because big business is just so so powerful, and our political class are are, are, are in in its grasp. Uh, I really don't know what the the answer is. 